it looks as though I hit upon an attractive subject. We've had several snickers from various locations regarding it, but I think it is a very basic problem, and that is an effort to understand the compound nature of ignorance. Now, in order to understand it, I think we have to go back and see what is happening or has happened in the early ages of the earth. After the Lord said to all creatures, be fruitful and multiply, the next requirement was some kind of survival. Survival became the primary need of living things. Survival was hazarded by danger, and the dangers of that time were natural dangers, disasters. The primitive world fighting for survival. So in the beginning, all effort on the part of living things was to develop the pressure or impulse to survive. This was apparently created with them, for that which is fashioned is expected to endure at least for a time. So survival was the primary problem of the human being and of all natural creatures around him on the earth. Survival required something. Complete ignorance was not capable of survival. And yet there was no clear demarcation between ignorance and anything else. And so far as we can understand in those days, ignorance ruled the world. Because there was really no situation permitting the individual uh, to develop an orderly uh, sequence of rules or obligations or governments. The survival principle, however, was very strong and has always been strong and is still to this time. So survival began to involve something else. It involved some kind of source of information. The creature was not born with a fully developed mentality capable of reading, writing, and arithmetic. The creature was born in a kind of a state of bewilderment, but as bad as things were, he hoped to stay here for a while. Therefore, the problem of trying to find out what hurt the least, and what accomplished the most, and how to expend life most usefully in some way, all these were primary objectives. And in these objectives, the only possible source of information and instructions were, uh, were experience arising from observation and personal contact. Experience must do some good. And primitive man, in desperate need of everything, began to be interested in experience. He began to observe that certain things he did got him into further trouble. Other experiences indicated that on right occasion he did something right, and this sort of eased things a little bit. And so the problem of experience also included watching the experiences of others. He watched the various prehistoric animals, he watched the various semi-domesticated ones, and he watched also the actions of others of his own kind. And he began to realize that these others of his own kind shared his dilemma, but also through obser ob common observation, rules of survival could gradually be created. So survival was the result of watching other things live and die, watching the various processes and procedures by which the common obvious dangers of life could be averted or reduced. This, therefore, was the beginning of education. Education was the gradual accumulating of knowledge of things practical and useful. In the old days, there were no colleges, universities, or anything of this kind, but there were the elders. And those who had experienced the most were recognized as the guardians of those who had experienced less. <clears throat> and all the lives coming into this world were given certain help and information by the elders. 
the old ones, the trues, those who had experienced, those who knew, those who had watched, observed, and contemplated. Now all of this would be very rudimentary in terms of our present thinking, but it was possible for the olds to more or less clarify some of the doubts of that time, to make things a little easier for those who were still in swamp and jungle. The olds could tell a little bit more about the nature of survival. They were the ones who had walked in strange places. They knew what was beyond the hills. They knew what was on the other side of the river. And this constituted higher education. And this education gradually went on until it resulted in a moderate state of security. It wasn't a severe and complete security. It wasn't anything that you might say uh, made life as we know it now, but it did extend the probabilities of survival. And it did help the individual to realize that he could know more than he did. Now, of course, ignorance may be just simply based on the concept of ignorance. The individual who's seen things happening around him observed nothing and profited nothing. The person who watched others suffer and did the same thing that caused them to suffer were in this difficulty because they had ignored experience or had failed to observe. So ignorance was the failure uh, to observe, the failure to share in common knowledge, and the failure to recognize the, pro the processes of universal law. So survival began gradually to impose upon creatures the fact that there were rules to the game. That no matter how you began or why you went, there were laws governing everything. Their mist mistakes were consistently similar. When things were done well, there were certain securities and improvements achieved. And when you ignored the whole thing, you struggled along below the level of the intelligence of your own kind and came finally to oblivion. So the beginning of it all was the recognition that there were rules, and the old ones repeated this and instructed the young. They set up various forms of passing on information, and it was always the elder teaching the younger, because there were no other sources of instruction. But this instruction included passing on the importance of watching nature, seeing how things operate around us, relating ourselves to the behavior patterns of other creatures, and finally refraining from those things which consistently prove harmful or hurtful. So little by little, the native kind of intelligence came up. We would call it today sheer ignorance, because in our terms of thinking, this primitive believing was little better than idolatry, little better than uh, imagination. But uh, even in those days, there seemed to be a rule governing imagination. If you imagine certain things, it was better. If you imagine certain other things, it was worse. And out of it all came the inevitable realization of better and worse, of good and evil, of security and insecurity, of emotion towards something better or a falling back into something worse. Nature never stood still. Having attained a certain degree of security, enough to build a hut or hollow out a cave on the side of a hill, the next thing that came after the problem of security that was most close to everyone was rebellion. We find the scriptures very clearly pointing this point out. The moment the individual attained a certain security, he wanted liberty. He wanted to do as he pleased. He wanted to be himself. He wanted to view the environment around him as something useful to himself. And as time went on, he began to be ambitious to dominate this environment. And out of this particular type of thinking came a, an impulse to freedom. Now, this impulse to freedom now extends to, to practically every department of nature. 
Every creature that has discovered existence has attained a certain pattern of security, then wishes to achieve liberty, to be free from domination. Obviously, the first and common denom uh, domination was the environment. The, the individual wanted to be free from the pressure of the necessity of doing certain things simply because they were there. He wanted to begin to think in terms of being a person. And the moment he began to feel like a person, he got into trouble. Because this is a very dangerous feeling. Still is. The individual, however, having decided he wanted to be free, began to use every faculty at his, at his possession to achieve freedom. Out of it all, the determination to do what he pleased. Freedom wasn't very much in those times at best, but it was a rebellion against inevitables. It was a, a idea that the person could be stronger than the laws of his environment, and in fact could go so far ultimately as to create new laws of environment, and that these laws which he created were stronger than the laws of nature. This was another fundamental error but it did rise inevitably in the thinking of human beings. So we got the uh, survival person, and we have the individual who, in his survival, wishes to change his own destiny, wishes to do something of himself, wished to possess something himself, wished to train or dedicate some ability, but most of all, self-expression, to escape from a kind of bondage which was a pr an imprisonment within the framework of natural law. So as long as man has existed, he has resisted in many ways the pressures of nature around him. <clears throat> he has wished to dominate everything, but as yet has never developed the faculties and powers capable of domination. So this brings us to the next step in the problem. Domination, which he wanted very definitely, was for a reason. He wanted to be better than somebody else. He wanted to be stronger than someone else. He wanted to be richer than someone else. So a whole group of patterns were created by which the individual should, could satisfy his own ambitions. Ambition arose by comparison with other things. There were creatures stronger than he was, creatures that lived longer, that were more fleet of foot. There were all kinds of things around him for which he could not really compete with. But he also found the possibility of competing with the mutual abilities of his own kind. So he wanted to establish the Olympic Games or something by which he would be create a competition, a competition based upon the idea of achieving greatness over something else to have a stronger will, a stronger purpose. And the will became willful. And because of this willfulness fell the angels, according to Bami, the German mystic. Actually, therefore, we gradually get the person around to the point where he may be still in a wigwam or a cave or mud hut, but he was now a person groping for progress, hunting and seeking ways of releasing himself from the entanglement of all other kinds of things. Now at this time also we have rising up, however, a few mysterious people, or mysterious beings, which are sometimes referred to as the ancient priests. There were some that were born, apparently, with a certain difference of attitude, a certain tendency not to create a, a conflict with natural law, but to try to understand that law was better than man's way of doing things. <coughs> the gradual discovery which ultimately produced the priest or the medicine man or the psychic leader of a tribe, these were recognitions, possibly by extra sensitivity of the individual, that there was something that if you didn't play the game right, you got into trouble that therefore there should be some way of restoring the dignity of the rules, the laws of nature, the laws of the universe, 
The universe at that time probably was a small square of land uh, inhabited by a few people and a lot of strange creatures. But in any event, it was life. It was the pattern of things. It was a place. It was our share of the good earth. So the uh, one person who uh, became more attentive to procedures began to realize that the more the individual achieved freedom, the greater his difficulties became. The moment he believed himself to be capable of going above the common rules of his kind, he was in trouble. So the more sensitive individual began to recognize that rules were the basis of security, that the individuals who kept the rules was the one who survived. The one who went out on his own did not survive. Seton used to tell this story about the bison herds of the American Southwest. There were always some kinds of creatures, wolves, jackals, cats of various denominations and sides, that wandered along side by side with the buffalo herd or the bison herd. And they were watching, watching for one thing, and that was a young rebel. They were watching for a bison who decided to go out on his own, who would leave the strength of the tribe or herd and go forth of conquering and to conquer. As soon as this individual animal with a higher ego got a few yards away from the herd, down came the carnivores. And in a very short time, he was finished. Now, the same thing happened on other levels. Satan pointed them out on animal and human levels. There are those who want to go out and do as they please regardless, who just won't take instruction or advice from anybody. They've got to do it themselves. So they wandered away from the herd and very soon get into serious difficulties because strength was keeping the rules. Weakness was breaking the rules. And no man, no matter how much he considered his own strength, was strong enough to break the rules. So out of this realization gradually emerged the concept of somebody who made the rules and theology came into existence. But as yet it was all very primitive and tribal and each tribe had a pattern of its own. But gradually it became evident, uh, being evident and obvious that all of these tribes found the same experiences. They were in different localities, their philosophies worked out differently, but all by watching and observing came to the final conclusion that the universal laws were immutable. They could not be broken. Man cannot break the laws, but the laws can break man if he disobeys them. So out of this gradually there came the development of, of herds of animals as domesticated creatures, the building of towns and villages, and all kinds of exp experiments in individuality, in which the individual tried in all kinds of ways to find out what he could do. And as he went along, he found that when he did certain things, he had certain rewards, but everything he founded also had certain penalties. The moment he went away from nature and nature's basic principles, he was in a confusion. All of his own ideas were useful and helpful, and he was proud of them. But a great many of them led to trouble. As, for example, the more the village grew in size, the, the less uh, possible it was to stay in it. Yeah, the village had to be left behind because the problems of sanitation had never been solved. And therefore, the village became a death trap, although it was the beginning of what we call civilization. And we're not quite certain now whether civilization is not an infirmity in itself. But regardless of all these things, our creature goes along. There was no schooling, as we know it, any more than there was school for rabbits and cats and dogs. But they all had their rules and they all had their laws and they enjoyed what we might term today a natural ignorance. Now a natural ignorance is not dangerous really because it is something we can get over. A natural ignorance afflicts everything that comes into this world. The babe that is born is not self-sufficient. Nothing that happens in our world is with a complete sense of certainty. 
There are always possibilities of alternate views. And most of all, there is the primordial lack of, of ultimate wisdom which has afflicted man since the beginning of time. There are things we can know and the things we cannot know. And up to a certain point, everything we could know became natural, normal, and possible. And what we could not know became the source of eternal fears, doubts, wonders, and conflicts. There was no centralized opinion about things we could not personally sense with the limited faculties that we possessed. So we came out with an ignorant person. An ignorant person uh, is one who is not schooled, but he's also one who may suffer now from ignorance, from the unwillingness to learn, or the unwillingness to accept ideas or beliefs that are contrary to his own willfulness. He will not accept the limitation upon his freedom without great resistance. And yet the freedom that he has, he has perverted constantly since he first had it. His freedom can destroy him just as quickly as his bondage can. All the various patterns of life that he sets up uh, are subject to certain rules and regulations which he has to finally accept. Somewhere in the dawn of time, the young sat around the old gentleman or the old squaw and listened to the stories of the people. They learned the ways of the, of the jungle, of the forest, of the desert. They found out how to tell what foods were edible and what were poisonous. They found also how to create animal uh, protections to, to domesticate animals. They learned, unfortunately, also how to kill each other. But they were all parts of this early knowledge or early education. And this ed education divided sharply into two branches the kind of education that helped us to do better and the kind of education that helped us to do worse. One was the means of advancing the divine plan and the other was a means of opposing that plan by our own willfulness and determination to do as we please regardless of consequences. Out of this comes another little Bible story of the building of the Tower of Babel. Here people tried to build a tower that would go up to heaven but they built it of mud and without straw. And as a result of it, it collapsed. And also, there was a division of tongues, and men no longer understood each other. So the uh, building of a civilization was a long and difficult, arduous, and stress-laden procedure. But it was made worse, not because of the actual seriousness of the situation, but rather of the unwillingness of living things to accept the basic truths of life. They would not accept equality. They accepted only that they, certain ones of them, would be better than others. They did not accept a general, a general brotherhood. Some were brothers and some were enemies. And enemies were people who opposed the plans of those who did not like them. And in every case, all of these different decisions added up to a tremendous encyclopedia of basic facts. We gradually build up over the period of the first 50,000 years, probably, of man's inhabitants of this planet, a way of life, a code, a concept of existence. We finally came to certain basic conclusions about what could be and what could not be. And at a very early date, these conclusions were built into the subject of religion and theology. And it was assumed that the gods, the manados, or the great spirits, were responsible for these rules that men could not break. And that these various deities, like those who kept the rules, and were a little unhappy about those who didn't keep the rules. And out of all this, the rules took on the idea of a moral tradition. They took on the pattern of the ancient wisdom, the wisdom that had been handed down from the past, the simple laws of common sense. So we may say that in the days of primordial ignorance, common sense gradually evolved as the panacea. There was nothing very scientific or very profound or very world-shaking about common sense, but it was a key to survival. 
It was a way of estimating the probabilities of things. It was a way also of approaching a problem from a point of experience, and that man could ex solve problems, and having solved them, could leave a written record of these solutions for the service of those who came after him. So we have experience, and we have common sense, and we have folk knowledge of the basis of education. Well, then we know that uh, the moment this occurred, humanity divided into two essential groups. Those who accepted this uh, new uh, concept of survival, who were glad and, and happy over being able to solve certain problems, and the other group who resented the whole idea from the very beginning because it interfered with doing exactly what they pleased. The, the freedom of will was hazarded, and this hazarding of freedom became a moral evil to those who were morally inadequate. So that we now have here the beginning, uh, we might call an, an assumed ignorance, a new kind of ignorance, an ignorance resulting from the dissemination of false knowledge. And this false knowledge came into existence for one reason and one reason only, individuals not willing to live according to the laws of nature. They had to do it differently. Therefore, the knowledge which they acquired in the development of their own egos became, we might say, a very complicated form of ignorance. All of that has descended now to our present time. We have schools, we have universities, we have all kinds of places where the individual can go to learn the essential values of a kind of living. In other words, he can find partial solutions, at least, to his determinations to be free, to do as he please, and to create a great and, con and opulent future for himself, individually and theoretically, collectively, but the collective part, Selen gets mixed up in the idea very deeply. Each person is out for himself. Now, having come to this idea of how to be successful, they began to teach it. And this process of being successful has been what might be termed pr practical or uh, acceptable learning. That which did not improve the individual's temporal condition uh, was not necessary to his success. Now, success was a very interesting thought, and many, most people today devote their lives very largely to the concept of success. They want to be successful, and if there are laws interfering with that, if they're man-made laws, we, they break them, and we call it crime. And if they um, are divinely made laws, they call it sin. But sins are not very important to the average person. Crimes are more difficult to get away with. So the problem of the individual breaking away from the pattern by motive of self-determinism left a very serious weakness in our systems of learning. In our dis definite determination to do what we want to do, most of the world has forgotten what we were supposed to do. Uh, the, uh, the idea that we came here from some remote source and went through hundreds of thousands of years to gradually develop a mind has been overlooked almost completely. It has been assumed that the mind was just given to us to do as we pleased with, that we could use it for the most unpleasant thinking, that we could use it to corrupt ourselves and others, and we could use it as, a, as an excuse or defense against the mistakes that we make. Now, by the time we have been thoroughly educated, we have what is called acquired ignorance. We have an ignorance which was not given to us by nature, or by the gods, or by any outside factor. We, are, uh, we have acquired a schooling on how to do wrong and get away with it. Or, to say the, maybe a little more genteelly, the way to live a life in this world 
with indifference to all the factors that are disagreeable to us. So this is ignorance of the factors that we do not want to accept. We do not want to believe basically in equality. We do not want to basically believe in the victory of right over wrong. We want to believe it theoretically and then do as we please. So we have an education that is now based not upon experience, not upon the wisdom of the elders, not upon the truths that were first carved on the cave walls of ancient Sp uh, France and Spain. What we are now trying to do is to create a new kind of world, a world to be fashioned to do exactly as we please. Perfect freedom, the ability to invent as long as an invention is even possible. Uh, the possibility of becoming rich as possible and, and then holding on to it, which is not so easy. Everywhere we want to be exactly what we want to be. If we want to drink ourselves to death, it is an inalienable right that we can do so. If we want to be kind, it's very nice. But if it's expensive, we generally get over this type of feeling. <laughs> So actually, we have created a new kind of world. It is a world in which we have created a kind of ignorance which will help us to survive the mistakes that we make. We won't, do not want to do it right primarily. We want to do it sufficiently so that it will serve us, but not that we will serve it with any true integrity. So we have today uh, to find what might be termed basics, and they're not easy to find. They're not easy because we do not believe in them any longer. We believe in certain uh, specialized attributes. Way back in the dawn of things, when there was an argument, somebody threw a stone. And that gradually developed into a slingshot. Then we put a handle on one side of the stone and made a tommyhawk or a battle club out of it. Then we developed the bow and arrow. And then after a while, the throwing spear, which was the primitive weapon of the Western Hemisphere. We went on a little further, and somebody found out that the Chinese fired our firecrackers for weddings and funerals. So we took the idea and made a cannon in order that we might uh, shoot each other. After that got a little longer, and then everybody had a little bigger cannon. Then there something had to something else had to be accomplished in order that we should always be victorious over the adversary, and of course the adversary was always part of ourselves. So we gradually broke up humanity into a mass of conflicting units, each struggling desperately to survive according to rules that were essentially wrong. Therefore, the education should have come along at this time and begun to correct these errors. But what education did, instead of explaining to, us, explaining to us why we shouldn't build bigger cannons, the education now tells us to make nuclear bombs instead. And that becomes a symbol of the higher learning of our materialistically oriented culture. We always get over a bad situation by creating a worse one that will eat it up and then we will suffer because the thing will turn on us. So all the way along, the problem of ignorance has never essentially changed and cannot change until the individual determines within himself the difference between ignorance and wisdom. The uh, evidences, the monuments to ignorance are so numerous that even the sc school child today is beginning to feel this uh, 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 this process. So he is now striking for freedom. And freedom is taking him back to the first days of emergence from caves. Today we want to show that we do not respect the mistakes of our elders by creating an antisocial situation. Instead of, however, of trying to uh, turn against our elders, we would get much further if we would look more deeply into the basics of life. It is not our ancestor that is responsible primarily. It is always an attitude, a conviction, and a belief that is unsound. That gets us all into these difficulties. 
grandfather may have had it, great-grandfather may have had it, but the fact that he had it and that we don't like what he had, so we create a revolution against grandfather, is ridiculous. The revolution is turned against a person, but the very ones who are revolting are in that own turn, in a little different way, doing the same thing we, result in, we, we uh, reject in their ancestry. It just keeps on repeating itself. So the problem of the need for the clearing up of ignorance uh, has to be given some kind of thought sometime, or gradually humanity will return to the caves from which it came. Because it cannot stand the constant uh, battle between personal willfulness and universal truth. Just, the two are incompatible, unless the individual rises above himself. These basic laws will never come down to his level. He has to go up to theirs or he is in trouble. And you go up to theirs, the higher levels of things will result or require self-control, discipline, idealism, integrity, a fraternal relationship with life, revolutions of a peaceful nature in which we find joy in growing whereas revolutions of a militant nature lead to nothing but distress. So we are looking around now to see where we are beginning to work on the problem of getting real education, to come into the possession of an acquired knowledge that will serve us. We have as the basis of an acquired knowledge an internal life around a mysterious power principle or energy which we call the soul. There's something inside of ourselves, a small voice that gets smaller as, it, as the days go by, but it's still there. There is an internal realization that we're wrong. But we haven't the courage or the strength or the integrity to give that a, a realization an opportunity to express itself. We are convinced that in our present state, the first move toward living better is going to strip us of everything we have. We are going to be outlaws if we become intelligent. The reward is not to be intelligent, but to become part of a pattern. The, the rebel, the teacher, the idealist, the dreamer, these are outcasts, rejected by a society that wants none of them. There are certain things we have not been able to reject because of the tremendous intensity and universality of them, such as, for instance, religion. But we still are able to live in the presence of it without being greatly influenced. And most people, regardless of their religious affiliations, are seeking primarily for fame and fortune. These are the things that come first. Now, we're going to try to do something to change this basic ignorance. Then we must say or believe that this basic ignorance is, is uh, mo in a sense, moral. It is kindly. It is rather simple. It's just, I don't know, but I'd like to find out attitude. And any individual who wants to grow must grow by gradually becoming aware of things he needs to know. And, and providing with this, with this knowledge a sense of his own acceptance. If he wants to live better, he can. It will please his inner life, but not be particularly fortunate in his economic environment. Therefore, all the way along, the individual has to stand for principles, or he must become involved in the compromises which we now call civilization. We are now standing at a point where it is obvious that we are in serious trouble. We also realize from daily reading of the uh, rather pessimistic press that this trouble is not getting any better to speak of, that we are still trying to make things work that never have worked since the beginning of time. We have tried to fight our way to peace. We did that with stone axes. We did it with bows and arrows. We did it by just throwing logs at each other. It never ended. The, in, the possibility of fighting our way to peace is not acceptable to universal law. 
But the universal law has its own way of solving these things. And these, the way that nature solves this type of problem is very simple. It is in the very principle of gradually achieving basics out of natural ignorance. The uh, answer to animosities is simply friendship. The answer to over ambitions is moderation. The answer to uh, militant aggressiveness is a non-aggressive, non-militant effort to restore the integrities of human relationships. But nobody is much interested in them. No one wants to see that everyone is fairly treated, because to do this would create what to young and ambitious persons is a universal monotony that they cannot even think of enduring. The adventure of killing themselves is very close to their minds and hearts. The, the possible winning of the great lottery of life, the possibility of becoming an alcoholic and still retain the love and friendship of mankind and keep your job. These are the things that are concerning most people. It's ways to do what they please and not suffer from the result. And wherever this is taught, this is acquired ignorance. It is simply taking something that isn't so, glorifying it, putting a few letters after its name and considering it intelligent. We cannot solve these problems simply by aggrandizing of the trouble itself. We cannot point to how noble the difficulty is, when in reality the nobility lies in the worlds of solution. Now, how are we going to get a better group on education? If you send a small child to school, we know that child doesn't know too much at that time, but it doesn't need to know very much because it is under the strong protection of parents. Now, if these parents don't know anything, that's a little difficult for the child as well as the parent. It's not recommended. But if it is, is true, then the opportunity for the parent to grow a little is, in, is intensified by the needs of the child. And the thoughtful parent sometimes does thinking for the first time when confronted with a small child who so needs to know, and the parent hasn't the slightest idea what to tell him. Now, this fact that nobody knows what to do about anything is not the, the keynote of a great advanced civilization. It is actually only evidence of something that has missed the mark for a great deal. and must either go back and start over, or nature will step in. Now, nature is not cruel. But nature has certain moral factors in it. It isn't moral in the sense that it stands somewhere and preaches sermons. Nature, however, does reward that which is right by certain securities and integrities. And it punishes those that are not right by certain difficulties. And because most people aren't right, the difficulties are, not, are numerous. All right, you piled up a universe of difficulties vast structures like mountains piled upon mountains, and the difficulties are being strengthened and intensified every day. You pile up something like that, and then you turn to the people and say, we will show you how to, choose, uh, to solve this. But they can't. The, the mountain will not disappear. The solution does not lie in trying to make the mountain endurable. Nor can you take that mountain and mine it for gold ore or anything of that kind. All you get out of it is trouble. So as the problems grow greater and more and more people are out of work, more and more people are doubting everything, then the question arises what to do about it. And the answer to the, uh, to the informed person, to the naturally ignorant individual who wants to know more, is to find out exactly what the problem is and, thir and cure it. The intellectual, instead of the intelligible approach to this situation, is to take the mountain, climb it, measure it, and decide that it can be built still higher. As we do this, we, want, we point to the mountain as a great, great natural disaster, as a great natural hazard, when it is nothing of call of that kind. It's our own building. The difficulties that we face are not put there by outrageous providence. They are put there by the simple mistakes of people 
either cannot or will not grow. If they cannot grow, they have simple ignorance. If they can grow and don't, they have compound ignorance. And most people suffer from one or the other. But there is in each individual the inalienable right to do that which should be done. There is no possibility of taking away from the person the potential of being an intelligible, reasonable individual. There is no solution to our economic problems, our employment problems, our uh, population problems, unless we get to understand and live in harmony with natural law. We're here to become wiser in the ways of truth. We are not here to get ourselves into a disaster and then spend the rest of the evolutionary period trying to get out of it. We are here to do things the way they need to be done. And this is very obvious. The great ignorance is therefore the willingness to accept false answers to facts. The individual is perfectly willing to be deluded into the belief that the pattern by which he lives and by which he hopes to profit, that this pattern is sacrosanct and he can hope to fulfill it. Now we've got a situation in which nearly everybody is out trying to deceive somebody else. The whole process of business has been corrupted. We no longer think of the, the barter and exchange methods of the past. All is built upon a very strange but rickety foundation of man's inhumanity to man and man's ultimate selfishness to everything except himself and to everyone else except himself he is just one of the victims of the situation. This uh, leaves us uh, with certain uncertainties about uh, how far we've come in this great evolutionary plan. Are we really getting somewhere? Yes, we are getting somewhere. There's no question about it. We're learning, but it's a hard way. It's an individual suffering a hundred times more than he should. It's an individual who hurts for ages and generations when he should have had the tooth out in the beginning and let it heal. He's an individual who has been disillusioned until his heart is broken but he has never been willing to give up the illusions that cause it. He is a good-hearted person who has believed in the brotherhood of man and skinned everyone in sight and been skinned in turn. This is the way uh, the thing has gone. Somewhere along the way, we have lost the, uh, the contact with the divine, and yet we sit on that contact all the time. This planet is a direct contact with the infinite reality of things. This, contact, this earth is one of the great books which we are able to read. It is, it is almost a visual, literal, symbolical representative of Holy Writ. It is the same thing. Here in our gardens, in our mountains, in our valleys, we have the law, as the old Indian, American Indians believed. We have the great spirits walking from the peaks of mountains. We have around us all of the realities necessary to our security if we will meditate upon them, consider them, and learn the lessons that they teach. And we have to realize that the voice of God is heard in the winds and in all the voices and sounds of nature and the voice of a God who is a little disappointed in his creation can be heard also in the confused sounds of the commonwealth and of the in tremendous intricate uh, organization of man's present communal existence. The war and howl of cities, uh, the bleat and cry of the suffering, and the incredible uh, sounds made by modern television programs and the like, we should tell us that something isn't happy. And where we, can, where we enjoy becoming intoxicated, or we'd rather take narcotics and die, something is wrong. And a civilization that has come to this is not right, basically, or it wouldn't have gotten here. We are just missing the lesson, and missing it badly. We are perfectly willing, apparently, 
to have a revolt against society, which we do by some form of eccentricity. We wear our hair longer or our beards longer simply because it is our idea of a revolt against tradition. We have a right to the revolt, there's no question about it, but the length of our hair will not solve it. We'll be just in the same trouble with hair down to our waist or with our head shaven. We're going to be in the same problem until the revolt takes the form of a definite, distinct recognition of the need for re-educating our own lives. Unless we do it, uh, the answer will not come. So we have now uh, come to a point where most, many people don't think life is even worth living. They're not very much interested in survival. That's why maybe they will keep on being alcoholics until they pass on at a very early age, simply because life is meaningless. For the humanity to have lived for millions of years, to come to the time that the human being doesn't care whether he lives or dies, is not a success. So all this glamour of the skyscrapers, all this glamour of computerization, all the wonderful achievements that we brag about have left us very poor little creatures without any real reason to exist, afraid to live and afraid to die. This is a very sad end of a great program, but it doesn't have to stay this way. It doesn't have to remain a tr disaster, but the individuals who want it to change must see the need for the kind of change that must take place also within themselves. There is no reason in the world why the inner life of the individual cannot be improved without intruding unnecessarily upon the structure of a society that is opposed to him and is against him. There will always be and always have been good people. There always have been people who are willing to make sacrifice, who would like to do it better, there are parents who would like to have their children better educated. And one of the simple grounds I can start the whole thing is on the level of education. We are entitled to an education that is inspired by need and not by policy. Children growing up need to be educated in the basics of living. They need to know the difference between the natural ignorance of infancy and the acquired ignorance of the higher educational structure. They need to know that what they are learning will help them to be better human beings and not be satisfied to make them technicians who can command a high salary. We are training everyone today in an economic uh, conflict, combat, and uh, unnecessary situation rather than to educate them to be people. The individual with all the degrees has to go down and die like everybody else. He has, uh, in almost every case, broken homes, delinquent children, great wealth, and still greater miseries. He is perhaps worth billions, but he is tied down to narcotics. He is uh, held bound by alcoholism, or he has one of them of the many disasters which definitely prove the insufficiency of success. The uh, school then should, have, should begin to think in terms of basics. The uh, school should perhaps begin with the parents before the children go to school. Maybe every parent should be required or at the time of the birth of a child to have some type of basic counseling as to what is important and real in life. Years ago, when I uh, was quite young, I went to a barber who was an, a, an immigrant from Italy. He had come over, brought his family and his children, and he was running a barber shop. And uh, we got talking about things of interest. And while he was kipping here and there, by, uh, we talked about his motives. He had three sons, and his own idea was very simple. He said, we came over here, clip, clip, in order uh, that I could make these boys rich, clip, clip. I'm educating them, I'm sending them to university, 
They're going to be professional men. They're going to have all the education I never had. And they're going to be successes. Good, good, good. <laughs> and this was to him something that almost everyone would say he was a good man. He was trying very hard. And he was. He was working in this little barber shop day and night to make sure that his younger descendants would have better life than he had. But there was no obvious indication that this was going to happen. And the answer is that probably the father, in spite of his mistaken ideology, was the greatest success in the family because he was trying. He was working hard, struggling hard, to bestow privileges which were in themselves comparatively worthless. So this is what we have. And something has to be done to get back uh, to a proportionate situation. As we look at the map around us, we see an absurd situation in the hands and mishandled by absurd people. We find no basic effort to understand the values of living. No understanding of the possibility of humanity uniting its resources to go somewhere as one solid group determined to learn, to grow, to live, and to love. Instead of that, all the little frictions. Every uh, person who is strong regarding himself as a slave master and enslaving those beneath him so that people lose all faith in government, lose all faith in law and order, and gradually come to identify man's made law with universal law. And this, of course, is the ultimate disaster that the laws of men are merely expressions of the laws of God. If they are, they're misquoted, because deity never did it that way. So we have to find, if we can, some natural way to find that we don't know. Now, how are we going to know that we don't know? Well, one way is to ask a series of basic questions and see if we can answer them ourselves pass them on to our friends and see if they can answer them. And if these questions are basic, nobody can answer them. So the answer, primary answer is that we are not yet in a condition or position where we can definitely say that any pattern that we set up is inevitable. We cannot say that we know all there is to know about any subject. We don't know all there is to know about an automobile. We don't know all we need to know about a universal government. We do not know the fullness of anything. Science is still searching and groping for answers that it has been seeking for several hundred years without too much success. Laws are being constantly amended because they don't work. Medicine is in constant revolution between the effort to become more uh, profitable to people and the opposite attitude of being more profitable to themselves. All these things show that after all these years we haven't gotten where we should have gotten. It doesn't seem possible that the world can suffer for 500 centuries or something of that nature and not find out what causes the suffering. How that always the pattern is the same. Now, when one man succeeded gorgeously and somebody else suffered from exactly the same procedures, it would be more complicated. But it is not that way. Suffering goes right after the heels of mistake, always. And uh, this we have to, to finally address to. So here we are, in the uh, end approaching of our century. A century of the greatest material progress the world has ever known on a century burdened with the most horrible responsibilities and tragedies that the world has ever known. Must we therefore equate and regard as identical progress and misery? Do we have to feel that all progress has to be attended by tragedy? Do we have to think that the more who die on battlefields, the more advanced we become? No, we don't have to. We could learn something along the way. If we were farmers down in the deep south a hundred years ago, we would have some simple answers to these things. 
Maybe no one would pay any attention to them, but they would be right answers that we cannot use today because we do not know how. So we have this practice. Are we going to go on fighting a battle that we must lose, and which are we are losing every day? Or would it be better to stop for a moment, reconsider, and head in a different direction? I think the uh, answer is beginning to emerge, as it did in the days of the Cro-Magnon and the time when the dinosaurs were swallowed up. There is a continuing pressure now, the recognition growing among people in all parts of the world that the present situation is not right, that it's not something that can be cured by more of the same. Misery cannot be solved by creating more misery. We cannot make peace by continuing to create violence. And all around the world now, there is a tremendous sense arising of the wrongness, the falseness of this concept upon which we have built so relentlessly. We can see it in our investments, we can see it in money, we can see it in theater, drama, literature, art, science, mathematics, and theology. We can see all these things. We can see where the weaknesses are. That we see why an individual can graduate from a university and become within a few weeks a hopeless heroin victim. Education that did not prevent him from becoming and a drug addict. Another type of education, not quite so recent, he became, became an alcoholic. Always the, the education didn't save him. Education apparently wasn't the answer to making the man right, but it should have been. Right? The education should mean that people grow up to learn something about life. Now, some think this two dollar subject Nobody wants to do that anymore. They want to watch Dynasty on TV, uh, which, of course, is a highly ennobling experience. <laughs> if there's anything that should lead to a universal reformation, it is something like Dynasty or D uh, Dallas. That really should cause us to realize the mess we're in. But we watch it. And most people are kind of a little jealous that they're not one of the contending characters. <laughs> but it's still the fact that this is just an aggravated example of a situation which we now call fiction, but is unfortunately more than history. It is something that we should be learning from, and we should learn to outgrow from such things, but we don't do it. But that actually, we have to learn, I guess, the hard way. But the way is getting hard enough now so that learning ought to become increasingly popular. We have to, before the end of the present century, begin to get roots down to facts. We have to realize that the answer to the eternal search for knowledge is to find out how the infinite would do it and do it that way. We should have to try to change place with some universal providence and, they, and determine in ourselves how that providence would take care of the delinquent child or the delinquent country or the delinquent race. We have to get back to some type of basic thinking. And uh, there are moves now that are in that direction. Education is breaking loose in many ways from the old stalemate that was, it was held in. But the intellectual is still the aristocrat, where it should be not that at all. It should be that the intelligent person is the one who is the natural leader. Intelligence is innate. Intellectualism is acquired. And most people are more interested in intellectualism because they get higher salaries. Also, you go further socially by joining with those who make the mistakes. You can get richer, but you can live shorter. And when the end comes, you can be very miserable. So uh, why not some way recognize also religion's place in this? Religion has been very much theology bound. Religion has put too much emphasis on the name of the faith. It has been put too much... Uh, emphasis upon the sectarian differences 
which have led in thousands of years to countless wars. There's probably no single greater cause of war than religion. It has caused some of the most miserable and terrible occurrences in the history of the world. And those it has not caused, it has been unable to cure. So that the problem remains that religion as we know it is not working. It is not working in the sense that it is not helping people to grow. Now when a small child is taken into the temple to be consecrated to his faith, this should not simply be a, a ritual. This should be a commitment based upon understanding, upon realization of meaning and value. It should be an indoctrination in a higher vision of life's purpose. It should be a consecration to integrities. Now, of course, those who are more or less materialistic in their thinking deny the, the, the theological virtues. Uh, they do not believe that the uh, righteous must always win and all that type of thing. They feel that that belongs to an earlier superstition. But I think they have one point against them, namely that the critic is not doing as well as the one he criticizes. Uh, the critic in this field, the materialist, is in very serious trouble. And it's becoming more and more doubtful that he can continue to sleep in peace as he realizes what his devices are doing to destroy the world. So consequently, the intellectuals, the individual who is the sophisticate, who does not believe in such ordinary things as the golden rule, is going to wake up sometime and realize that, that rule is going to be here long after he's gone. And it's going to be here, we hope, long after humanity has restored the integrities which he helped to tear down. So we have simple things like that. The golden rule in 50 religions, all nations, all peoples, who have had any basic intellectual understanding, have accepted that rule. They have found that it was the basis of something that was wiser and stronger and better and deeper than any arguments and dissensions could possibly be. Until man is able uh, to disprove the workings of universal law, he'd better obey it because the law is not going to be overthrown by any intellectual individual. They say they do not know the law, that we can't find out about the law. But because of the law, little ones come into the world every few minutes all over the world. Because of the law, we hope and we dream. Because of the law, we learn to live and we become a little bit useful to ourselves and others. Because of the law, we love and we become fruitful. Because of the law, we love our children. Because of that love and that realization of that law, some of us at least become merciful and compassionate of others. These simple rules are the basis of integrities that are far greater than the Einstein theory. These simple rules are the innate structure, substance, and essence of the creature we call man. They are par part of his fabric, and because of them his heart beats. Because of them his blood circulates. Because of them his heart loves. And because of him his ideals and his thoughts dream of better times. This is a creature. This is not something you can dissect in a laboratory. This is not something that is merely a synthetic creature fashioned out of man's experimentation. This is something that has been endowed with powers and virtues that no living person has fully understood. It is something that we cannot estimate, but we know to be one of the greatest miracles that we will ever face in our daily living. There is something completely beyond our understanding and completely beyond our skill. And yet it is a manifestation of something that we've all, in one way or another, come to depend on. We all depend on this heart beating. If it doesn't beat, we're in trouble very quickly. We all depend to a large degree upon dreams and hopes, beliefs. We all also depend largely upon physical structure. 
for the attitudes and the practices. Imagine a musician whose nerves did not tie his fingers to his composition. Think of anyone who is in a special precision work. It was not the skill that comes from some mysterious working of nerves and muscles in a body we don't understand. While man himself is a mystery, we should be rather reluctant to kill him off. While we do not know how he came into existence, we should not contribute to his uh, to early departure. We should be working with these things, finding out what makes them, finding out how we can understand them better. If you want to know how to run a country, study the digestive system of the human body and you'll learn a lot. And you'll learn things that you cannot go against. If you go against the digestive system of the body, you've got a sick person on your hands. If you go against the digestive system of experience in the world, you have a sick world on your hands. And no cure for that sickness will come until the evil is corrected or the mistake is made right. All around us, there are truths of a kind of world that we don't want to live in anymore. A world of simple values, of kind-hearted people who would just as soon be nice as be impossible. Uh, people who do not expect to and cannot expect to suddenly become wealthy, but who always dream that they might be one who could. And in order to get, chase this will of the wisp, they hasten themselves into an early grave. All around us is evidence of life. And there's also evidence that we are destroying life. We are doing things we cannot undo. We cannot re re replace what we have demolished and destroyed. We cannot restore the forest which we cut down. We cannot re restore the species of creatures that have become extinct, died largely due to our uh, personal selfishness. We cannot restore anything unless we change our habits, change our ways, and begin to think of ourselves in a proper manner. It's nice, perhaps, to believe that you might become a conqueror over a continent or take on a nation, but uh, think for a moment. Here we are on the earth, uh, which uh, Mark Twain called the molehill. Here is this tiny little planet somewhere lost in a constellation, the boundaries of which we've never defined, floating in a space that goes on from here to no one knows where. And here we are greedily determined to own it. We grad we determine that the neighbors shan't own it. We're going to divide up the, the real estate and make a reasonable or unreasonable profit. And here we fight with our little money bags and all our little thoughts and selfishness and ambition and grandeur complex while we are about as insignificant as anything in the universe. We are just a small planet, a kind of stupid one, but a kindly one of itself. Someone on another one putting a telescope on us might see the, some of the mountains or continents, but it certainly will not see successful persons or unsuccessful persons. All this is uh, an, inf an infinitude of errors, more and more every day. While we're here, I think the utopians had the best answer. While we're here, let's be comfortable. Let's do it the best we can. Let's free our minds from all this false stuff and take a little of that energy to study our own needs more correctly. Instead of sitting by the hour watching uh, imaginary plots on television or something of this nature, why not spend a little of that time trying to find out how to do things a little better ourselves so that we can help to make a better environment? There's no use being grand, great, and tremendous, ruling over something that is nothing in itself. No matter how many times men conquer the planet, the planet will remain unconquerable and such as it is, is hardly worth the effort. It's much better to learn to make a beautiful garden out of it, live in it comfortably with your friends, have a few pets that you enjoy, and follow the instincts of your creative hearts and minds and do beautiful things. There's no reason why not. It's not getting anywhere any other way. We will never build enough great machines uh, to express the natural affections and genius that is locked in the hearts of so-called average persons. 
we will never be able to take this little planet and change it into the ruler of the cosmos any more than we can take, make any individual the ruler of the planet. He may have ambitions in that direction, but in a few years he sleeps with his forefathers and he is no more. The, the, all physical things are transitory. All outward achievements are, at best, relaxations. The real labors, the real work, is to unfold the universal purpose inside of ourselves, the reason why we were created, what we are here to do, and to find out the difference between a native ignorance which says I don't know and goes out and tries to find out and an acquired ignorance who says there's, which says there's nothing to learn and I don't care if there is. This type of attitude has got to change if we want to get anything accomplished. Until we can answer the basic questions of life, we are not in a very uh, severe, uh, secure position. A scientist of the 19th century once said there can be no knowledge at all until man knows in himself why he is, what he is, and what his purpose is. All other things are secondary. All other things are of the luxury group. The, no, the nature of, of life itself is pushing us relentlessly to the point where we have to think straight to survive. And that's what is happening now. So instead of resenting this, instead of kicking against the bricks, as Paul said, let us rather go with it and say, if there's something for me to learn, I'll start right now. I'll try to become the person that my inner potential makes possible. And I will try to release through myself universal good as it manifests in me and share it with others. It can be a very quiet and sensitive adjustment. It may not change the course of history in the next few years, but it will change the course of our individual history forever. And we will go out of here with a better hope. And we will go out having justified the divine plan. But when we wake up, and there is another star in the inner heavens. And it's about time that we wake up, because things are getting pretty rough around here. And the sophisticated attitudes of everybody who knows everything, these attitudes are false. This is acquired knowledge, which is no cure to ignorance but is really one of the great causes of it. Because natural ignorance is simple. It's, uh, it can be cured. But actually, this artificial ignorance, this acquired philosophy that is not so, or the goals of which are not legitimate, or the purposes of which are not within the boundaries of natural law, all this type of so-called knowledge is deceit and conceit and can bring us nothing but further misery and misfortune. We can take these lessons to ourselves. We don't necessarily force them upon other people. But those who want to think a little better, and who have a little better hope for themselves and their own futures, and look forward to greater understanding of the universal plan and ability to live according to it, uh, will find that in a few very sen sensitive sessions with themselves, they can find out this cure for natural ignorance. And those are more sophisticated who become humbled by the victories of their adversaries can also become a little more understanding of what they could do to change their destinies. We will all endure what we must endure. As Saint uh, uh, Anthony, I believe, was one who said it. We will endure what we have to endure as best we can in charity and in faith. But that which we can change, we will change by a simple dedication to principles. If we live what we believe, our beliefs will keep us alive. If we do not live according to them, but live in conflict with them, claiming virtues that we will not practice, then we are part of this uh, world of individuals who have been educated above and beyond their capacities who have taken an attitude that is not true. So let us not, law, not acquire further ignorance, but it, let's get down to basic facts, find out how little we do really know, and do the best to know a little more about it. 
I think under those conditions, the blessings of heaven would be upon us. But to, 